Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Barbie Engel. I'm going to read Barbie's bio and then we're going to have a conversation like we always do. Uh, Barbie, she's a best-selling author, a reality personality. She lives with multiple rare and chronic diseases. And I'm going to try to get these right. <laughs> Reflex sympathetic dystropathy, migralepsy, Palbar 2 var endometriosis, and other pain disorders. Barbie is a chronic pain educator. She's a patient advocate, and she's president of the International Pain Foundation. She's also a motivational speaker, and she's a best-selling author on pain topics. Um, Barbie was living a dream. She trained and performed cheerleading, dance, and gymnastics starting at age four through college. Straight out of college, she started her own cheer dance training company. And a year later, she was hired by Washington State University as the head spirit program coach. She's been battling chronic pain since 1977, first with endometriosis, which resulted in a sympathetic dystrophy in a progressive neuroautoimmune condition that affects multiple systems in her body and needs to be treated early so the disability does not take over. She lost her physical abilities and was bed bound for years. Uh, using a wheelchair to get out of bed, it took her three years to get a proper diagnosis and another four years to get the proper treatment. So Barbie knows firsthand how hard it is to continue looking for relief for perfect dancers and then coming up against healthcare professionals who blow you off or don't believe what you're saying could be actually what you're experiencing. So as she searched for a cure, as she's searching for a cure, she's become her own best advocate and she works sharing information so that others do not have the same life struggles that she has. Even after seeing over 100 healthcare professionals, having major surgeries she didn't need, having complications such as internal bleeding, medication interactions, kidney stones, tumors, severe constipation, and more, Barbie never gave up or gave in. She was tested to her limits, and she realized that they are past the boundaries that she had placed in herself. Uh, Barbie puts it, I had to become the chief of staff of my own medical team. And she says, if I can do it, anyone can. We just need support and hope. So, Barbie, I thank you for being here today with Grief to Growth. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. A great job on, on trying to pronounce those uh, diseases, rare diseases. There's 7,000. So um, you did a really good job trying, <laughs> trying to pronounce the ones that I have. Um, the, the only dystrophy, you said dystrophy, which I kind of like dystrophy better. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then um, the, the uh, you said uh, Palver, Palver or something like that. And that's yeah. P A L. B, it's like spelled out. Okay, PLB. Bear okay. is short for variant, and that's breast cancer. Okay, okay. So, so it's a specific genetic breast cancer. Okay. Now, these things came on you after you were a professional cheater, cheater right? Yes. Okay. And was it all at once, or tell me how this how this progressed? So uh, endometriosis came first, and mm -hmm. that is something that women deal with. It's when your uterus grows inside of your body and starts attaching to other organs and to the um, abdomen wall. And mm -hmm. that was an experience for me, but I got through it and passed it and um, had to undergo uh, multiple surgeries, treatments, medications, and felt like I conquered the world. But in that time, I still was able to fight my way through and, and it didn't affect work as much as, you know, it could have. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I was like, yes, I conquered the world. And, and God said, no, you didn't, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're, you're still not on the right path and starts dropping bigger boulders. So next was reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And that's the one that was the worst. It, I had had injuries as an athlete Mm -hmm. um, throughout my life. And it was always easy to overcome. RSD was definitely not easy to overcome. And it actually 
took me from riding around in uh, limousines and private jets and on top of the world, living my dreams, taking life for granted to having nothing. I lost my first marriage, my house, my health, finances. Um, I, w- I went from on top of the world to food stamps and uh, had to start over. And um, that was definitely something that hit me the hardest. And then secondary to that, all these other things started developing like the microlepsy, which is uh, seizures connected to migraines. The migraines are connected to the reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And um, so that kind of just spiraled. The other things came after RSD really triggered my body to attack itself. So Mm -hmm. everything I was facing um, in my genes and in lifestyle and environment started attacking. Yeah. So um, I can, I I can't even imagine what that must've been like to have one really bad thing and and feel like you've gotten over that and have these other things, you know, start coming on you. So what was that like when you started dealing with the medical community? When I was going through endometriosis, I never really stopped to pay attention. When I developed RSD, I knew I wouldn't give up the life that I had. Mm -hmm. And so I was fighting to get that back. And, you know, going from doctor to doctor, provider to provider, I was doing what they told me to do. I was not taking responsibility. I was putting it all on them. Fix Mm -hmm. me, fix me, fix me. I would go in crying and just saying it hurts, fix me. And they didn't have really anything to go on because I wasn't able to speak to them correctly. I wish that was taught to us in, in even elementary school, start teaching the vocabulary and things that we'll need if we do develop a chronic illness or a loved one develops a chronic illness because it's one in three people that are going to face something that's that's dramatic and 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 tragic like this and mm-hmm. we're not ready. And so I had to become my own best advocate. I had to um, start learning to speak the same language. I had to learn that the medical system is working as designed, which is poorly, and that our doctors are really smart. They're very educated, but most of them choose a specialty. So they don't know with 7,000 rare diseases, they don't know all the diseases. So they could be a neurologist, but they might specialize in multiple sclerosis. And even though RSD, you need a neurologist on your team, you have to find one that's specialized in your condition, not just a neurologist. So you can get started by going to the correct doctor, but if they didn't study that specialty, that rare disease, they're still not going to be able to help you. And I didn't understand that. And so it took me 43 doctors to get to the right doctor. 43. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've yeah. seen over a hundred. Yeah. I, I have, um, I have friends that have some, some rare conditions. Um, and I know they, they, they talk about the frustration of trying to get the doctor to understand, to believe them, to really get to know them as a person, as just seeing them as this particular disease. Yes. One of the things that was helpful for me right from the beginning, this was so different. And this was the burning fire pain of RSD feels like some of a lighter fluid on you or in your veins and caught you on fire. And you just, you're consumed with putting out the fire and it's hard to concentrate. But one of the things I started doing was taking notes every day, slept for 20 hours. Um, I, you know, the, these are the things that I'm experiencing. And after a few months, you start seeing patterns. The thing I didn't do was I didn't share for the first three years what I was keeping in my journal. So mm-hmm. it wasn't helping the providers. It wasn't helping me. So not don't just keep notes. But once you start seeing what helps, what hurts, uh, start giving that information. Use those adjectives that you're putting in your journal with your medical providers. Because if I had said burning fire pain from the beginning instead of just pain, it would have launched me in a different direction. And I think I would have gotten treatment sooner. And I think I would have gotten more correct access to care. I got overtreated, undertreated and mistreated because I didn't have the right vocabulary. Yeah, that's, that's an also an excellent point. And you talked about, you know, being our own advocate and because a lot of times we're taught that doctors know everything. Uh, We're taught to, to to defer to them, to just go in, as you said, say, fix me. And we're not taught to, to try to learn ourselves and be our own advocates. 
Exactly. And because of that, that is that is exactly what we're taught as children. You don't feel good. Your mom takes you to the doctor or your dad takes you to the doctor and they give you some medicine and you go home and you start feeling better within hours to days. And, you know, they told me after my accident that, that triggered the RSD to start attacking my body. Uh, they told me I'd be better in three or four days when I went to the hospital. Wow. And here we are 20 years later. So it, it, <laughs> they were wrong. Uh, and um, it took, you know, took the three years to get a proper diagnosis. It took another four years after that to get the right treatment for myself. And it just was a, a fight, a struggle, and a challenge the whole way through. And I had, I grieved. I wanted my old life back so bad. It was a, a full-on grieving process to, to realize all the things I had lost. And um, people like I marry now and I have a husband who he didn't know me before. He didn't know what I lost. Mm. He just saw me for who I was now in front of him. And fell in love with me for what he saw of who I was in, in my worst moments of my life. So in my head, I I'm going through all this grief. And in his head, he's like, why are you sad? Why are you depressed? You're, you have this amazing life. You are an awesome person. Why can't you see that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, grief is, and, and grief can come from a lot of things. We think of grief a lot of times associated with, with death. And I know you've had some loss in your life to yes. also of people, but yes. sometimes people don't understand that losing a lifestyle can be just as grievous of an event. It can cause just the same types of feelings. And it, I really, it, it's interesting what you said about your current husband, because he doesn't know the loss. He doesn't know what you had before. He doesn't see that loss, right? He sees you as, as what you are now. Yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredible. If you're not going through the grief, how... Um, you can see the positives in life. And that's something that takes practice when you are in the midst of the grief. Like even I, like you said, I lost a lot of people. I'm the, I'm the third oldest living member of our family. There's only 14 of us left. Um, all of my grandparents and parents and everybody have passed away. Step parents have passed away. And um, that like, as, as they passed away, it was sad. And I had, I had that grief in that, that moment, mm -hmm. but it, it was something I was able to move on and move through. I've lost boyfriends. Um, uh, one was in high school, um, drinking and driving. He knew he was too drunk to drive. So he asked somebody else that only had two beers to drive him home. Mm -hmm. And that two beers was too much. And he head on collisioned with another car and killed my boyfriend. So I've, I've had grief with losing people in my life as well. Losing my dad in 2016 was a totally different kind of grief. He was our cornerstone in our family. Mm -hmm. He was the one who taught us our life lessons and, and made sure that, that we were okay. He's the one who got me through mentally and, and, um, and helped me through the grief of losing the life that I had built for myself. And then he was gone. And that took, I mean, even just till the lockdown, till the pandemics, I was still you know, grieving, you know, four years that every time you said anything about my dad or something happened and, and it was about my dad, or it reminded me of something my dad taught me, I would start crying. I would just burst into tears. And it's like, this is not normal to go through so much grief, or is it, I, you know, it, with the other people that had passed with my, when my mom passed the year before a woman told me it's okay to cry. Jesus catches your tears. And I'm like, but I'm okay. My mom's in a better place. I had that comfort mm. with, with my dad. It was just a uh, grief in my cells. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, grief is different for every person and it's different for every person that we lose because you have a different relationship with them. And I think a lot of times we expect it to be the same, but you know, as you said, even with parents, with one parent, it, it might be one way with another parent, it might be another way. And yeah. I'm wondering with, with all the grief you're going through with the medical things, how did that impact your grief when, when people would pass away? Did, how did that work? It definitely caused me to flare. That's what we call it when the symptoms exacerbate. Right now, sure. um, since 2009, I've been in and out of remission. So um, I do have to use my wheelchair sometimes. 
times, but it's not every day. It's not, I'm, I'm not stuck in bed every single day anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, um, I do have a treatment that's helpful and, and got me living life again. When I go through the grief, it kind of puts chemicals, not kind of, it does. It puts chemicals into my body physically Mm -hmm. that causes everything to be heightened, including my emotions. So when you're going through grief, when you're going through depression, which who wouldn't be depressed if you feel like you've lost everything or you've lost the anchor in your life or the tether. So it, it definitely, um, you go through that, that chemical reaction, which exacerbates the symptoms of the diseases that I live with. Right. Uh, and so even though it wasn't something that happened to me, it was, you know, my father passing away or my mother or my grandmother uh, passing away, it happened to them but I feel it physically. But I also, if my husband cuts his hand, I, if I see that cut or I see it happen, I have that physical pain. I take on his physical pain. And he's like, it doesn't hurt that bad. And I'm like, it's excruciating. Like, (laughs) what do you mean? It doesn't hurt that bad. Right. And and for me, it's excruciating. And that's how my brain is processing it, processing the situation, Mm -hmm. even though it's not happening to me. And so it happens when, when I lose somebody, it happens when I see somebody get hurt or injured, my body physically takes that on. Well, that's just another example of how I, I believe we're all one. And some people don't really realize that some people realize that on a much deeper level. And it sounds like you're one of those people that and I, I'm the same way. If I see someone get cut, I don't feel pain, but it, there's a weird feeling I get like in my stomach, you know, it's just like, I, I, I can connect with that. And so when you said when someone passes away, it doesn't happen to me. Well, yeah, everything that happens happens to us, right? It's, it's all from our perspective. So I can understand why you would feel, you know, that intense grief when, when people, you know, leave. Yeah. And, and I do. And I think I, I try to say it's not happening to me because I'm trying to use my mental tools <laughs> yeah. and skills to try to, to try to move through the grief. Right. to get to the other side. So I try to, to reframe that that happened to them. So I still have, I'm still here on earth. I'm in this realm. I still have to mm-hmm. do the things that I need to do to live this life to the fullest until it is my time to, to go on to heaven. So yeah. I, I, I try to separate it mentally yeah. a little bit to, to help protect myself. So no, I, can't I keep moving forward. Yeah, I understand. We do have to have a certain amount of separation. And, you know, it's, it, it reminds me of, you know, having children, like with my daughter, you know, anything that happens to her, I feel like I feel it worse than she does, but I can't control her life. So there's this, this, this thing we have to do with ourselves. I have to say, okay, well, that's her life. You know, I can't control that, but still it hurts. Yes. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's okay that it hurts. Right. Right. It's, it's something that, that it's part of being human. And I believe we are connected. In one of my experiences, I had a near death experience, my lung collapsed, and it was uh, laying on my heart, it was causing cardiac arrest, I had emergency surgery. In that process, my life flashed before me as if I was on my way to heaven. Hmm. And I woke up in a hospital room thinking heaven's not as pretty as I thought it was going to (laughs) be. Really? Yes. And, and, but I, I was actually still here on earth, but I, my life flashed before me. And what I learned was let go of the stress, let go of the small stuff that the thing that matters most here on earth is human connection. And the, the person that like, you didn't even think for two seconds about you might've changed their life by smiling at them or holding a door for them or asking if they're okay like that two second interaction that you here on earth in this realm, we feel like doesn't matter that human connection, that networking that we're building Mm -hmm. matters the most. That is what matters. And um, even if it's for two seconds or, or your whole lifetime, somebody's in your life, it all matters. Yes. And, and all the stuff that I stressed about and dad, how am I going to eat? I don't even, I don't even have any money anymore. Barbie, every God will provide you. You just have to trust and believe. And, and, you know, it, it's, it, he was right. I, I, I never went a day starving. There was always a resource or something when I need it, that comes into my life. And mm-hmm. it's because of the networking and the connections and the, 
focus on human connection versus on things and people. I would rather have a life experience now than an item or something that that's of value. I would rather have time with a person. Yeah. So um, earlier when you talked about the endometri endometriosis and you feel like you kind of got yes. through that and then you got hit with this other thing, you mentioned like God threw something into your life. So what is what are your feelings about why these things have happened to you? Well, I think that we have a life plan and things happen to us to help us fulfill our purpose. So we can't always see it at the time. Mm -hmm. But when you look back, you can say, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I've, I've literally helped save lives, like having patients trying to commit suicide, run into the street, and we're physically right there to stop them, help them and, and continue to get them help. Mm -hmm. um, th that I wouldn't have been there in that moment. That person would, would have still had the pain that they have and the grief that they have and what they were going through. But I, I wouldn't have been there to help them. And I was supposed to be. So what I've been through is to help me help other people. And that is my purpose here on earth. And, and I was taking life for granted. When I got sick with RSD, I literally wasn't thinking about life. I was thinking about me and where am I going to shine and what am I going to do? And now I live more abundantly, not thinking about, Oh, what can I get out of this? But where am I supposed to be? Let me stop and think, let me stop and process. But I, God was giving me signals and he was like, he gave me endometriosis and not to be mean or harsh or, or put a wrath on me. Um, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. I don't mm -hmm. think it has anything to do with that. And I wasn't doing bad things. Like I wasn't killing or murdering or, or hurting people. Right. I just wasn't living my life for my purpose. And so he was saying, here's a sign, here's a sign, here's a sign. And I was ignoring him. And then he said, here's a boulder. <laughs> yeah. And, and it got me to stop and focus on the things that I was here on earth to focus on. So I stopped wasting time. And time went from being a 24 hour day to living life to your fullest in each moment and taking away the, the stress and the guilt that people can put on you or that you can accept. Hmm. Now, when I start to feel like somebody's putting guilt on me, I will like do a physical action where I take that guilt and I just drop it out in front of me and say, that's not for me. That's not my guilt to bear. I it's, it's, um, it's my way again of, of coping through, of, you know, I want to come to your birthday party, but I might only be able to stay five minutes and that five minutes, I'm going to give you the best me that I can give you because I wanted to be here and I wanted to be in your life. But physically I might not be able to handle an hour long or five hour long birthday party uh, that has all this noise and streamers and fun and dancing. I'm, I will give you what I can give you because I want to have that human connection with you and and knowing that this is moments instead of just a 24-hour period what all can you throw into it yeah I, I, purposeful I, and mindful of i that. love what you just said that reminds me of, of a client that i'm working with and who's in a really deep grieving process for someone that they just lost you know like a month or so ago and people are putting all these expectations on them and i was i was working with them they said well i have to go to this thing this afternoon you know, people expected me to be there. And I was like, you need to take care of yourself. And, and I, I really like that physical action that you that you said, I'm just going to take this, and yeah, I'm going to drop it. Yep. I like, I like that a lot, because people will they will put things on you. And when we're in having a physical condition, like you are, or we're in, we're in deep grief, self care is the most important thing. And sometimes we have to set boundaries, you know, we, we, we talked about all being connected, which is one truth. But there's another truth that says we have to take care of ourselves. So we need to know where and how to set those boundaries to say to people, I'm just, I'm going to give you what I can give you, but I maybe not be able to give you that right now. Absolutely. And, and we forget, like, you need to have a good balance of physical, mental, and spiritual health. And if one of those things is out of balance, it will knock the other parts out of balance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really does take a toll on you and, and, wherever you need that self-care, that's where you need to 
put put yourself into balance and make sure that that's okay and they're using those tools and for me having something actionable that i can do just i'm going to drop that right there for for you me whoever whoever needs to see that i'm just going to drop that you don't even have to tell the person you're doing it you mm-hmm. can mentally help yourself by grabbing that that grief guilt whatever it is that's negative and dropping it away from you and and know that you don't have to go to a party you don't have to go to any anywhere or or anything it, you get to go that's right. what living on this earth is and you get to go and if you get to give it five minutes or you get to give it four hours it's okay right. everybody's going to be okay you have to take care of yourself first just like on an airplane you put your oxygen on first make mm-hmm. sure your children are okay your immediate family and then you help other people if you can that's exactly how god wants us to live is is help yourself, help your family, help your friends, help the bigger network. And, and, um, you know, it, part of giving others doesn't mean taking away from what you need to do for yourself first, because you can't fully give you if you're not full. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting as you say that I was thinking about when I was a kid in Sunday school, they taught us this acronym, joy, Jesus, others, and you. So you're supposed to put Jesus first and then others and then yourself, which is that's not what the Bible says, though. Right. It's backwards. <laughs> but they were they were teaching this to us. And unfortunately, I see a lot of people still, and, and especially with women, because I think women are taught even more, it's all about everybody else. And we need to take care of ourselves first. Absolutely. Yes, it's Jesus, you, oh, others. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um. So, it, it, and that's really, to me, that's what the Bible teaches you is you can't be living for Jesus if you're not taking care of yourself. And, and so that has to come first and then you can help other people and you will be able to do that more abundantly mm-hmm. once you are in line with yourself. And, and, and it does not mean that, oh, I am not feeling like I'm a, a 10 out of 10 for, for this area of my life. So I can't help you. No, you can still help other people, but you need to have a focus on your life and yourself and making sure your balance is okay. That is your number one job. And then you have that you'll have abundance and you can help other people. And it is, it is a responsibility to help other people, but not over yourself. Yeah. And I, I can, I completely agree with you. And I, I looked at, you know, Jesus as an example, and, you know, I think of all the times that Jesus would like disappear, like, where is he? You know, he's off praying. He's off doing, he was taking care of himself because he was giving so much that he had to, he had to sometimes take time to himself to fill up. And exactly. so we look at the example, that's, that's the example. And, and we can, we can only give if we have something to give. And if we burn ourselves out, we can't. And I, you know, you are a perfect example because your body is so sensitive that, but it, it applies to all of us. If we don't take care of ourselves mentally and emotionally, it's going to eventually reflect in our body and it's going to, it's going to cause us stress, which are going to cause leads to other things. Absolutely. And a lot of times doctors will say like, what else is going on in your life? What else is happening? You know, it can't just be this physical thing. And you're like, oh, well, I have stress from this, or I took on the stress from that, or, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. My father-in-law, he always will say things like, oh, I got to go help Jeff or got to help Susie do these things. And, and I'm like, you don't got to do it. You're choosing to do it. So reframe it and put it in, in a positive frame. You get to go help these people and, and Hey, you hurt your shoulder. You can't, you can't be helping them. Hopefully they can now turn around. You've helped them. They can help you because you help them through their tough time. And, um, but if they can't, somebody else can. And, but we're caregivers for him, yet he's out caregiving for other people. And we're like, you actually need to care for yourself first, which will help us not have to care for you as much. Not that we don't love you. We just have to have time to spend on ourselves and caregiving for ourselves as well. So there has to be a balance or you see the trickle effect in the people you're trying to help. Because you want to be able to help somebody so that they can help somebody. It may not come back to you. That person's help may not come back to you, but it could go on to help somebody else. And that's the, that's the network that we're all in that different people can help different people, but we have to help ourselves first. 
Yeah. So I, I want to ask you, so what do you think has made you so resilient? Because I, you know, as, as, as I hear your story, as other people hear your story, people are going, I would have given up at that point. <laughs> you know, I, I would be done. So yeah. what do you, what gets you through this? We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, if you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. I hear that a lot, and I have reflected on this a lot, and I think part of it is I was born this way. <laughs> I think also part of it is lifestyle and environment. Mm -hmm. I, I practiced, practice. They, my coaches used to tell me in cheerleading, they would say practice makes perfect mm -hmm. and practice doesn't make perfect practice makes better. And, you know, when your team, you're cheering on a team and, and the football players are down and they're giving their all, but they're losing 50 to zero. And you're still down there on the on the sidelines smiling and trying to get you know noise on a third down and get the crowd pumped up. You have to keep smiling through the the diversity, adversity, everything you're facing in that moment that that feels like it's negative. Well, really in a football game, it doesn't matter. But for me, life is is my game. Life mm -hmm. is where I score my points and, and my life experiences are points on my my board. So if I'm alive, I'm still playing this game and, and it might feel at the time that I'm losing 50 to zero, but my game is not over until I move on to heaven. So I can keep going and I can turn the game around in this quarter or two minute time period. It might be a losing time, but it's only a moment. And I have the rest of my life with, with this game of life and, mm -hmm. That I so I think that practice made me better, but I also believe that I was born with it. But I don't think all people are, are born with resilience. I think it's something that you have to cultivate and grow in. And it and so I've done both. And because I practiced my talents given by God, I've done better. But I still have my moments, I still break down and and, and cry in grief and, and cry in pain. I just learned to then give myself time to do that and, and get through that and then um, pick myself up and, and use the tools that I have practiced and built to move on to the next thing. And sometimes you have to smile through the grief, even though it's hard. Yeah. God didn't no. say life was going to be easy. He said he was going to give us life. Yeah. You know, you, you just said something there that, and I reflect on it a lot and I don't have an answer yet. If, you know, is, if it's resilience, is it something that's, that's born in us or is it something that we can develop? Or I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, but I hear so many people say, well, and my daughter passed away when, when six years ago, when I, she was 15 years old, people say, oh, I could never live through that. And, or, or people might look at you and say, I could never do that. And I say, I think that these things reveal what's already in us. I think we don't, we don't get a chance to exercise. And I, and I tell people you're stronger than you realize. Um, Cause we all, a lot of us have said that we made that comment. I could never live through that. I could never, but humans, we have an amazing spirit and we'll do what we need to do. And we'll figure, we'll figure out a way. Um, but, you know, but there is an option. I guess people do, some people do give up. So it could be a little bit of both, I guess. Absolutely. And I've lost a lot of friends to suicide due to pain. Mm. And um, it's, it's hard. And, and when, when I first started losing them to suicide, it's like hard enough to lose someone to an illness or an accident that's out of their control when mm. they choose, like, I no longer can take this pain. 
who am I to say? I mean, I, I, I can, I can pray that they're, they're right with God. And maybe that's their path to, to teach us a lesson here on earth that our medical system's broken. We need to fix it. Um, we need to come up with cures and we need to come up with options and treatments that, that are more helpful. And this could be the catalyst to do that, losing that person. Sure. But it, it ultimately, it, it ultimately was their choice. And I have, have chose to make a different choice. And I think part of it is this is my purpose. Maybe they fulfilled their purpose on earth. And so they, they feel that, and that that was how they're supposed to go. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I won't know until I get to heaven and all will be revealed. So I try to trust and believe that even though they choose that to give up, it's not a choice I would make. And it's not a choice I would put on somebody else or make for someone else. If someone said, I want to die, I would talk, I would start a converse. That's a conversation starter to me. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's talk about, do you know your purpose? Do you know what you're doing here on earth? When it's your time to go, you you will go, but you still have a purpose to fulfill. Have Do you feel like you fulfilled your purpose or do you feel like you're stuck and so now you want to give up because you're stuck or you don't like your situation and that that's the way you're choosing to get out of it? There's other ways to get out of it. Have you thought of those? You know, have you thought through it yet? Um, so I would try to talk somebody out of it. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm so passionate about life and living life to the fullest here on earth. But I also have lost so many friends that I can't judge them for that being their choice. It's sad. It's hard. It gives me grief. And, 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 you know, I, I also have to respect and hope and pray that they were doing what was best for them and not just giving up, but um, really knew that that was, was where they wanted to go. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very, uh, enlightened point of view because suicide carries such stigma in our society and people, you know, will sometimes say that this person has given up or they were weak because they just chose to take their lives and, and it carries stigma for the people that are left behind. And I, I personally believe that we should try as best we can not to judge another person, person's path. We don't know what their path is. We don't know how that, that taking of their own life might impact somebody else, even in a positive way. So it's not, for, it's not, I don't think it's for us to say. Right. And, and it, that's exactly how I feel. And, but it did, I didn't start there. I started with right. anger right. and grief that these people are, are committing suicide. One was my best friend. She sent me a box about a month before she passed away with, a, I mean, it was like a care package. Mm. And each, each item in the package had a sticky note on it with a little message. And I still have some of the items from that box that, that have her little messages on them. But she literally, she, I thought she was doing okay. She got married and the next day jumped out of a 10 story window. The day after she got married. The wow. day after she got married. It was like, you, you don't understand. Right. You, you just don't understand. And and she had me to talk to. She, she, we had talked. She had, before getting married, she was in a women's shelter for being battered. Wow. You know, she lived through that. What, what, what happened in that, in that moment that she decided to, 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 this is it. I'm done. Like, this is the happiest I'll ever be. I'm, I'm married and I fulfill the goal. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, a, I, that's, I don't a know. I think that's another lesson for us because I also hear people sometimes when someone in, around them chooses to take their life, we'll start judging ourselves. I should have known. And there's a perfect example of, we don't know. We never know what's going on in someone else's head. And we hear, you know, someone's taking their life and, um, oh, but they were so happy. Um, you know, we'll, we'll hear that. And it just, it just goes to show that we, we can't, we can't know what's going on in someone else's head. Right. And that's between really, like we say, health medical is between you and your providers. Um, it kind of what, what's going on in, in your head is between you and God. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There, you, if you have, if you have a, a, a mental challenge to get through, you, you have people, tools here on earth, including people to help you through it. But ultimately, if you choose that, is this is I'm going to choose my time to go. I'm going to be in charge of this moment. Um, you know, we we really 
I don't know if there's anything that we could have done to, to change that person's choice, except for offer tools, a, a listening ear, um, hope and faith, but, right. but we won't know why. And I, and I've come to, I've grown to understand that I won't understand all the whys until I go to heaven and, and then it will all make sense and it will all be answered. And so I, out of it, the growth, I think that most I learned was patience, mm -hmm. patience and knowing that you can't control every situation. You, you can't control anybody else. You are only responsible for yourself. And, and unless you're a parent and then you have to, to be responsible for your, your child till they're 18. Mm -hmm. But in, in most parents are parents far longer, like, you know, responsibility wise, far longer right. than 18, right. but you know, legally that's where you have to live too. And, and, you know, th then you have to say, all right, it's up to God. And I don't understand. I don't see the picture, but I have faith that it's the right thing. You know, that's one of the things that I've come to um, in my my journey. Um, you know, we were when we were children, we were taught the Bible. It said, you know, that God works together all things for the good of those who love him. Um, I expand that even out to because it's everybody that God loves and that's everybody. So I think I think everything. <laughs> even every even if you don't know God, God knows you. Right. And I, I think. I've come to the conclusion, this is this is not based just on the Bible. This is based upon what near-death experiencers tell us. This is based upon a lot of other things that everything is working out the way it's supposed to be, no matter how it appears. So I agree with you. It, it's patience. And I love this quote by John Lennon. He said, everything will be okay in the end. And if everything's not okay, it's not the end. And that is that is the patience that you're talking about. It's like, yes. well, this sucks, but it sucks right now. You know, it's not going to suck forever. And I don't know what's going to come out of this. And that includes everything, as, as I said, even with someone who chooses to take their life. We don't know. We don't know how that fits into the big picture. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's hard. Like with, with my dad, we didn't know. Like four days before he passed away was his birthday. He turned 71. Mm -hmm. And my I was like, I, I just have this feeling like I, I should push through my pain physically to get on a plane and, and go. Mm. And my siblings all were like, dad's doing the best he's done in years. Don't worry. You have time. And four days later he was gone. And I was like, I knew it. Like I knew, I knew I, I, I had the message go, go mm. now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get, I, I, I listened to people who didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Who who said he's fine? He's the best he's been. And was that a gift from God for them to to be with him, feeling like this is the best he's been in years, and they got to experience that? I I fall on the gift of he taught me everything he knew before he, that he was supposed to teach me before he passed. Mm -hmm. What I was supposed to have out of our relationship was complete. And and he was able to go without me coming. Right. Right. And then th that's that. I love that. It's such a matter. Everything in life is a matter of perspective. So we can choose how we look at things. We can choose the story that we tell ourselves, you know, and there's, there's the fact you're right. There's a fact that you weren't there when your father passed. That's, that's not changing either way. So you can look at it either as I missed out on that opportunity or you look at it. That's the way it was supposed to be because he had taught me everything that and both are equally true and both are equally valid and you can choose how you feel about that situation exactly find it finding the positive and i know i am a cheerleader like i find the positive if i'm losing <laughs> yeah it's it, that is something that is a that is a talent and something that i practice like consciously practice it so that when an unconscious thing happens a challenge arises in my life it's easier to get through because i've practiced even getting through the easy times. I've practiced getting through the hard times. I'm able to, to get through the hard times easier because I put that practice in consciously when I don't even know I need it, that skill is there. Yeah, and you, you use that word practice a lot and I, and I do too and I, and I love, and the thing is for me, I am, I am by nature a glass half empty person. I am, I am a pessimist. I'm like worst case scenario always pops in my head first. So I was talking with a client the other day and I was giving her some advice as to, you know, some things to do. 
And she said, does this work? And I said, yeah, it works, but it's practice. It's something that you have to work at. So it's not, people could look at you and say, oh, that's just who Barbie is. I could never be that way. I could, I could never do that. And I'm here to tell you, you can't, um, but it's a matter of, of putting in the effort. It's, it's a daily thing. Yes. Well, I used to think I was a glass half full person. Mm -hmm. And through all of the experiences and challenges that I've faced and, and gone through, I realized that I'm a glass always full person. Mm. And the part you can't see is hope. Mm, mm -hmm. But my glass is always full. And sometimes I need more hope than I have tools and skills and resources of. Mm -hmm. which is the part everybody else can see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't need as much hope because I have so many resources, tools, and, and positivity that's filling up my glass, but my glass is always full. It's just not always visible to all the people. Yes. I, yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't, I've not really, I, once I say that people go, oh, yeah, but yeah, glass half full, half empty. I'm, I'm always full. It's well, never empty. And the thing is, it's all relative. And, it, and this is human nature. You know, it's, it's actually evolutionary. We focus on the problems because that's how, that's how our brains are built. Um, so no matter how good things are, we can always find something that's wrong. You know, it's, it's a little bit too hot in here, you know, until, you know, it's 115 degrees. And then we realized it was great when it was 90. So the thing is, when, when you have injuries and illnesses and things, then when you're having a good day, it feels like fantastic. I so connect with that. <laughs> I so connect with that. In the beginning, I was like, this is the worst pain ever, 10 out of 10. And then I, I thought it couldn't get worse. And then things would happen and it would get worse. And I would be like, I wish I could have that old 10 back because that 10 wasn't really a 10. I was perceiving it as a 10. But this is this is now my new normal. This is now my new 10. And that is now a two. And I would definitely take that that old 10 back. It, mm -hmm. it definitely puts things into perspective as you face challenges and as you go through challenges and really not even it doesn't have to be a challenge. It could just be living life. It could be the, the best moment of your life. But then you have you're like, this is the best moment of my life. And and then something else happens and you're like, this is the best moment of my life. Yes. Or the worst, you know, my niece asked me, uh, my, um, some family members have COVID and, mm. and two of them are struggling really bad. They're all in different States. They're all isolated. They just happen to get it. And, um, and my, my me, I only have one niece, but my niece said, I was talking to her on the phone, trying to do mental health with her while, you know, she's seeing her, her parents go through this. And mm -hmm. she said, aunt Barbie, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you hmm. and she knows she i mean she's she's seven but she knows some of the things i've been through she's seen some of the things i've been through and and but my answer was i haven't faced it yet hmm. Hmm. the worst thing that's going to happen to me on this earth is when i go to heaven which will really be the best thing that ever happens to me but the worst thing that could happen to me hasn't happened yet Hmm. It was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I don't know if a seven-year-old can comprehend that, but that's that when she asked, that was like, what came to me? That's my answer. I've been through a lot of bad things, but the worst thing hasn't happened to me because to me, that would be not living here, but then I'll be with Jesus and right. I'll be like, everything is amazing. And I don't have worries and I don't have health challenges and I don't have financial issues and and the things that we stress about in this realm, I, I will, I will be full and whole. And so it will be the best thing for, for my soul, for my physical body. It will be the worst thing. Cause, uh, cause I won't be in it. Yeah. So, well, that hasn't happened. That to me says and this, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I, I don't, I, I'm getting a practice where I try not to see myself as my body. So my body is something that I have as opposed to who I am. So for me, death will definitely not be the worst thing because I get to see my daughter again. Um, and so that's just that's just a transition into another phase of life. 
So I, I don't know that, you know, what the, the worst thing, and this is the thing that, that, again, my practice is like, I'm trying not to judge things as good or bad because everything is good and bad. It depends on how you look at it. And as we, okay. as you've gone through all the things that you've gone through, and as we read through your list, we're like, well, that's horrible. That's, that sounds awful. But now you're an, you know, an international pain advocate. You're a motivational speaker. Uh, you've been on a reality, you know, television show you're doing all these things because of the quote, worst things that have happened to you. So I, I wouldn't say at this point, my daughter's passing was like a great thing, but I wouldn't be doing this if, if it hadn't been for that. So in, in that sense, it's a gift because I believe this is my, this is my purpose and, and it's all temporary. I'll see her again, you know? Yes. So. Yeah. And for her, it will be the blink of an eye, right. less than the blink of an eye for you. It, this is our, our realm of time that we're currently experiencing. So it, it definitely is harder to, to stay here on earth. It, I wasn't saying that, that my, my body physically, that would be the worst thing is right, right. not being this body, but my soul, my, my, I am is with God in heaven and I won't have any stress or worry or anything else. So it's like the, it literally is the greatest thing. Right. And I get to be with all, all the people that have already passed into heaven. And one day we'll all, you know, all the people that I love and, and, and want around me will all be together in heaven. Yeah. But we have to fulfill our purpose first. And that is the greatness of living life that God gave us. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, very human thing. And it's always interesting to me because I was raised as a Christian. I was raised in in a church, the Bible and everything. And when I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15, I was like, well, if heaven is so great, why does anybody want to go there? And I think it's because we don't really we don't really believe that it's real. We don't, you know, we don't, we, we kind of do, but you know, we don't really know, I guess. Um, And once for me, I, when Shana passed away, I started studying the afterlife and uh, all this, all this stuff. And I've learned so well that I'm like, I don't fear that anymore. In fact, I'm looking forward to it in a way. I have a purpose to fulfill while I'm here. I will fulfill that purpose while I'm here, but nothing really bad can happen to me. Right. Well, and and I remember as a kid, they would, be like, you're supposed to fear God. And I was like, no, like God loves me. Like, why should you fear somebody who, who loves you? Right. You fear him. If, if you are doing harm to yourself or others, that's mm-hmm. when you should fear him. But if, if you're living in God's light, there's no need for fear. There's you, you know, we're here for a purpose and God gave us free will. He gave us choice. He gave us the ability to fulfill our purpose all we have to do is take action and, and, um, back to your body as a vessel. I really, when like all this UFO stuff in the last few years has come in into play, I started thinking about like, well, really earth is a UFO. Really? My body is a UFO. <laughs> like it's a tool to get me around the sun and, and I'm on the earth, which is a vehicle to get me around the sun that like where I get to, to live my life, but that's what a UFO is. Like it's, it's a, it's a object that takes something or somebody around Mm -hmm. wherever the universe Mm -hmm. to, to get my body is my vessel while I'm here on earth, but I will be with, with the almighty all I am. He is. (laughs) And I, and so this is just my vehicle that I'm taking right now. I will move on to my, my, whatever the next one looks like. I don't know. I, I imagine it to be a, a bright light mm-hmm. um, and, and maybe twinkling stars. I don't know. I, I don't know what it is, but it will be heaven when I get there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, what getting back to the medical aspect. So what would you tell people that are either in chronic pain or have rare disorders or having difficulty getting diagnosed? What are some, things that they can do What's some advice you could give practical advice would be learn about the condition you have if you're not yet diagnosed it means what they your idiopathic is what they call it they don't understand it yet Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it's not real or that you're not going through it it just means that the doctors haven't figured it out yet keep moving forward learn as much as you can make a journal uh, create an oasis around you and um, whether that be your bed bound create that oasis around you in bed. What tools and things can you have around you in, in that space? 
Um, mm -hmm. If you're able to get up and be ambulatory and, and live, you know, more fully in, in a physical capacity, mm -hmm. take advantage of those tools. Don't feel the guilt of someone saying, oh, you don't need to be in a wheelchair because they feel awkward of you riding in a wheelchair. So then you stop living and stop doing. Get in the wheelchair, show them that you can be more and you can do more with that tool or whatever tool it is, a cane or mm -hmm. a medication mm -hmm. or surgery, whatever it is that, that can help you live more life and fulfill your purpose. Take control of that and know that there's great reason for hope. There is help. And all you have to do is reach out and seek out. It's there. That's awesome. Um, one of the questions I had asked you for some questions uh, to, before we started this. And one of the questions was, how can people save thousands in their medical bills? So that's something that's of interest to all of us, because we all deal with this crazy medical system that you, that you said is working as designed. I'd like you to elaborate on that also. So two questions. First, how can we save in our medical bills? And why, why is our system so screwed up? So this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Medical bills. I have had over a million dollars in medical bills and I am not in debt. I found the way to navigate the system. So th this is something that you can do to help with your medical bills. First thing is, if you don't have insurance, everything's negotiable. Find out what you can do. Can, can you make payments over time? Can they give you a cash price or a charity price? Can the resources in your life help you out? everything's negotiable. If you have insurance, insurance companies are designed to negotiate for you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they work in your favor. Sometimes they don't. They, they do practices such as prior authorization where they delay your care so that they save money, which I really don't under, it saves one department money, but it doesn't save the other department money because right. you can worsen your symptoms in that moment or time because they're delaying your care. So it's an odd thing that they do. It's an odd tool they use, but it saves one department money. So that department gets a pat on the back while the other department's going, how do we help this person? Yeah. Uh, but every doctor sends you a bill. Your insurance company will send you what they call an explanation of benefits, EOB, because that's hard to say. <laughs> EOBs come. Doctors will send you the bill before they get the information back from your insurance for what your insurance negotiated for you. Mm -hmm. If you do not pay the, do not feel the pressure to pay that bill immediately. Wait for your explanation of benefits. If your name is spelled incorrectly, if your date of birth is incorrect, if the codes that they're putting down for the treatments that they're giving you or office visits they're giving you is incorrect. Any of those things, even one letter in your name can charge can can affect what they charge you and what they negotiate for you. Mm -hmm. So check, make sure your address, your information, all your data is correct on every single bill and then pay what the insurance company says to pay. Now, if that's still too high, know that it's negotiable. You can work it out. You can pay $10 or $5 a month on that bill over time and, and get it paid off. Usually if they see in good faith that you're trying to pay it down, they will negotiate or just let the rest of the bill go. Mm -hmm. and, and that has happened. Um, prior to knowing that, that you, you can do this, I would just try to pay every bill until I ran out of money. And then I didn't have money to pay my rent or you know do, do the things I needed to do because mm -hmm. I was trying to pay off these medical bills. And once you pay them, you're not going to get the money back. So make sure that you wait for your EOB. If it says patient responsibility zero, on your EOB, circle it, take a photocopy, send it in with the bill and show the doctor that you owe zero. Mm -hmm. They stop billing you. Yeah. They just need to update their system and they need to know that you know how to read a bill. And just because they're saying that this is the bill, that's not the bill. That's, the, that's what they are reporting before it's negotiated on your behalf. Every single bill has to go through a negotiation process. Yeah, that's a lot of really good advice. And I could just a little anecdote. My wife had knee surgery, knee replacements last year. And we got the, we got our portion of it back and we thought it was going to be the entire deductible. But when she called to talk to them about it, they were like, well, if you pay it all right now, we'll give you, it was like a 40% discount for paying cash. Yep. And we're like, so we thought, okay, this is our deductible. This is what we're responsible for. And you're like, no, if you just pay it all right now, we'll, we'll give you. So it was, it's a huge discount. So huge discount if you, if you, if you get a big front. bill always always at least talk to them about it you know 
I, I think that's great advice and, and understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I so had a bill. I, I had my rib taken out twice, the same rib, but um, the second bill was $18,000. And that was like my largest bill at that moment. Like mm -hmm. they trickled in, but this $18,000 and I, I was, I couldn't, I was like, I, I'm out of money. I can't pay this. Like I've already sold everything I have. I don't, I don't have the ability to do this. And, um, I saw on TV it was when Katrina happened, the, the hurricane back mm -hmm. in 2005 and, or 2004. And I said, all these churches are donating all these money to all these families. They're not even asking if they're, if they belong to a church or they're Christian or anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, I should ask my church to see if they can help me. And even after my insurance, I still owed 18,000. Mm -hmm. And um, my church stepped in and showed me how to negotiate. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and, and so like, I, my $18,000 bill got down to zero. Wow. That's awesome. And so even if, if they can help you with funds, great. If they can help you with negotiations, even after you think it's negotiated, the word no is just the beginning of a negotiation. Yeah. There's always a way, just keep searching and, and you'll find it. Yeah, I think that's really important. So you, you again, you mentioned earlier that the medical system is working as designed. What did you mean by that? It's working exactly as designed. It's designed to make the insurance companies and the doctors and providers lots of money. And it's a designed for acute care, which means uh, short term, you break your arm, you need stitches, you cut your hand on, on making dinner. It's designed to take care of those acute situations that are now that need attention. It is not designed for long term care, which is the most expensive care. So not all, not only um, are, are we faced with these large build challenges and life devastation with with all the aspects of our life, but the the system is not designed to take care of chronically ill people mm -hmm. and because of that it's it for instance a veterinarian is able to take care of lots of species and all different types of traumas if if it if the animal has cancer they know how to treat it if the animal has a punctured lung they know how to treat it if the animal has diabetes they know how to treat it but when it comes to humans Every single health professional has their specialty. So if they don't know about it, they, they, they'll say things like, well, this is all that, or I have nothing that can help you, or there's nothing that can help you, hmm. which is really whew, heavy yes, on us. Absolutely. Just because a doctor says, I have nothing to help you. I have nothing else to offer you. It just means that that tool or resource is, is not for you. But there's other providers out there that are willing to learn with you or already have the skills and knowledge to help you, even though you have a, a chronic long term disease or condition. Our system just isn't set up to communicate that mm -hmm. or teach us how to find it. But know that there is hope and is help. And that's one of the things that I do with International Pain Foundation is help patients find the providers that they need for whatever condition that they're going through that's chronic because they, those, specialists exist it's just how do you find the one specialist for you that's able to help you they are out there sometimes it takes five phone calls sometimes it takes a hundred phone calls you just have to keep going and most people stop as we discussed before this is yeah. something that it's it's it, if a boulder is placed in front of you there's a, there's a million ways to get around it you just have to start take action and the people who take action get the hope and the help that they need. The people who just let it stop them and, and paralyze them don't. <laughs> and yeah. even the smallest step forward around, up, over, through, under, whatever way it takes to get around that obstacle or challenge, that's a step moving forward to, to be on the right path and get the help that you need. But our system's not designed for that. It's not designed to teach it. The, the most time you get with a provider on average is, is 10 to 15 minutes. Right. And you don't, don't even know how to talk to them with, during that 10 to 15 minutes. So they're going to lead the conversation, learn how to lead the conversation, go in with a one pager that talks, that has your questions ahead of time. So you don't forget to ask your questions because the doctor took you on a different path 
um, because they are in a hurry to get to the next patient. So it's, it's, it's working as designed. It's making a lot of people rich, but it's not helping give people life back in most instances. Yes. And as you were saying that, I was thinking, it sounds like the International Pain Foundation is a great resource. Is it only for people in pain or people with other chronic conditions? Can they take advantage of it? Uh, we, we focus on people with chronic conditions that involve pain. Okay. But um, our find a provider resource, we have two different resources. And you can actually not have chronic pain and still find a great provider. You just you put in whatever your... Um, condition is, or um, if you have an ICD code, which is medical language that takes time to learn, but you can find it on your, your uh, EOBs. Okay. You can find, find those ICD codes. If you put those in, we have an app on our site that uh, can help you. You put in your private information and it tells you the providers in your area. And you can say, I'm willing to travel if you're able to travel. Awesome. That's, and it also can tell you the about about price range of every provider that treats that type of condition mm -hmm. that you're looking at. That sounds like a great resource. So it's International Pain Foundation. Do you know the uh, website offhand? Yeah, internationalpain.org okay. is the website. And it's under resources, find a provider. Okay. And um, we have the AMA on there, but then we also have another one um, that's uh, powered by Amino. And Amino Health um, took, they, AMA, is only medical providers that are part of the AMA. Right. So it, it's kind of like buying your way onto a list mm -hmm, mm -hmm. type of situation. The, the Amino app, you cannot buy your way into this app. They take actual data, they data mined it and taking the patient's names off. They, they went through the ICD codes, the charges, the costs, what insurance companies are paying. And they put it all into this massive AI system, uh, um, artificial intelligence system mm -hmm. that data mines it for you and you cannot buy your way to the top of the list. It literally tells you this is what it is. And these are the providers that can help you with this specific thing that you need medically. That sounds uh, fantastic. I, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking of a, a particular firm right now that's got some sort of dystrophy. I don't, I don't know the particular one because there's so many of them. So many. Yeah. And, you know, just struggling with different doctors because she has different conditions and, you know, just really feeling beaten up and lost. And like, there's nobody there that really understands her, no one there to really help her. And it's, and it's just one thing after another. So I just, I want people to know about this resource that hopefully it can get people hope. Cause you said you have to keep moving forward it, that unfortunately the, the help doesn't come to us. A lot of times the, the doctors are not going to advocate for us. We're just a, we're a number on a chart with a, they see us for 10 or 15 minutes and, you know, they don't, they don't really, really get to know us most of the time. Most medical providers have over 2000 patients that they're caring for. Wow. Yeah. Like, how do they know your name? They don't, they don't even remember you from, you're like, I told you this last time I was here. Right. Right. You know, it, it's that's, and they're seeing, you know, one to 2000 patients in a month, especially ER doctors, uh, hospitalists, internists. You know, they see even more than that. Yes. But even your primary care doctor, ask your primary care doctor how many patients they have. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And a lot of primary care doctors are getting out of it because it's so yes. overwhelming. I was talking to the doctor I went to for several years and she was telling me, you know, how tough it is to be a primary care doctor now. So I'm not here. And I don't think you are to bash doctors. They're good no. people trying to do what they can do, but they're, they're limited. They're, they're human. And we've been taught to put them on a pedestal and think they know right. everything and right. they can't, but they're not, they're not, they shouldn't be on a pedestal. They should be used as a resource and a tool. Right. And if that is the right tool for you, that's amazing. My primary care doctor, he went to what they call concierge medicine and he dropped down to 600 patients and he doesn't, take any extra patient. Like he stopped at 600. He's like, this is what I need to maintain the, the life that I need to, to pay all my bills and take care of my family and, and my children. I'm going to stick with 600 patients so I can give them better care. It still and, sounds like a lot, but yeah, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Right. It's a step in the right direction, but you got to think like a third of us need a lot of attention. Right. A third of us hardly ever go to the doctor and then the rest are are in between, but it gives 
better care for the third of us that need more care. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have to ask you, we're kind of running out of time. I could talk to you all day, but I want to ask you about your reality show, what that was like. It was very interesting. It taught me that reality is not real. <laughs> <laughs> you see these shows and you're like, how could they do that? Like, is this quite real? There's a seed of truth in all of it. Mm. But then there's a producer and a writer, even on reality shows, that by the fifth or sixth take, you're not even saying it in your own words. You're you're acting at that point. Mm -hmm. So um, so know that there is a seed of truth in it, but then they build a story around it to make it interesting and entertaining for the viewers. Um, but like my biggest show, um, I guess, audience wise was on TLC. Mm -hmm. And um, after the producers, they, they came and took over our house and put up all the cameras and had, you know, someone following me, telling me what to say off camera. And, um, and by the time they left and packed up, I went through a morning of like, T can I trust my own words? <laughs> I am I strong enough? Am I smart enough to, to get through this? Because the, the producer makes you sound so good. That writer makes you sound so good um, or whatever it is that they want you to say. And you're saying stuff that you don't even know how they're going to edit it and make it into a storyline. Right. But they're, it's, it's a job and they're paying you. So, so know that when you're watching reality shows, watch it for the entertainment value. Mm -hmm. um, it's even even shows like um, uh, reality competitions where they're following you around for for months sometimes know that even that they they like will sit you in a room or you'll see them sitting in a chair with with just a bright light giving like a testimonial right. about a situation that isn't always filmed Im immediately they will film that like days weeks months later and work it into a storyline. So even that testimonial, that's especially where it's given to you. Yeah. Um, to match whatever they got on film, it doesn't necessarily match the words that they need. So they have you talking in this testimonial, showing something else, and it makes a whole different image of what's going on. Yeah, a little, little peek behind the scenes. Thanks, I appreciate that. Yes. Oh, Barbie, but I, I, like, I like doing reality because... Although it's not real, it gets people to connect to me that wouldn't have heard of me right. or know my journey or story. And I'm able to plant my own seeds afterwards because they'll contact me and say, oh, I feel so bad for your husband. And I'm like, he's taken care of. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what? How? why are we connecting? What do you need help with? What do I need help with that we connected? Because obviously you reached out for a reason. So well, tell me, uh, give me the people. name of, of your show or your shows. Uh, well, um, on TLC, it was called Extreme Time Cheaters, which when we signed on, it was Extreme Time Savers. They changed the name <laughs> um, to be more sexy. But um, Brainstormers was another one I did on the Weather Channel. Um, uh, the Ken and Barbie show, which was digital reality. We did nine seasons of that. Um, and I, I was a producer on that. So I had a little more say on that one. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Cool. Uh, but like, we're like, oh, I'm going to go at this angle. You're going to go at that angle. And so that it makes it more interesting for the viewer. So it's not always what exactly what you believe or think. Um, but it gets a conversation going. Yeah. So, um, but those are some of the big ones. But, um, and then I, I did um, Our Pain, which was uh, on CBS out of Las Vegas. Um, so it was like more regional, sh regionally shown, um, okay. but it was all about chronic pain and what chronic pain patients are facing. And um, that was like a 10 episode series. And I was on three of the episodes, um, things like that. So I try to work in my advocacy and my purpose in life right? and, and being a cheerleader of hope into the reality. So there's right. a seed of truth, but I'm hoping that it will make a connection that I can make into a fruit tree later on when it's needed of knowledge. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Barbie, uh, we are running out of time. I, I like to keep these to around an hour, but it's been really, really great getting to know you. How can people find out more about you? Where can people find you? You can find me personally at barbieingle.com, which is my name, Barbie with a Y, Ingle with an I. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> And, um, and then with the foundation, you, and I'm on all the social medias, except for TikTok. I don't do TikTok. Um, but um, just using my name, you'll find me. And then, 
And then the International Pain Foundation is also on social medias as well as internationalpain.org. If you are facing a chronic illness of any kind or a rare disease and you need some hope and help, that's a great resource to reach out to, to, to get you going and, and getting you to be able to take action in your life so you can live a better, fuller life. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource. I really appreciate you being on Grief to Growth today. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take care, Brian. And if all your, if all your viewers, really quick, if, if they're getting something out of this, like I am on your podcast, which is the this, please leave a review. Let Brian know how he's doing, how much you enjoy the podcast, what you're getting out of it, and give him five stars because he deserves it. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Have a good one. So that does it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you enjoyed it. If you like this content, make sure you subscribe. So click on the subscribe button here and then click on the bell to receive notifications and click on all. That way you'll be notified whenever I release new content. Thanks for watching and have a great day.